Our, our goal really over the next four weeks is that we want to build a case, okay? We want to build a case why uh, if you're not yet a Christian, why you should consider becoming a Christian, okay? As we build up to Christmas, this would be the best Christmas gift you ever got, all right? Forget the space hopper or anything else that we're going to see revealed in the next few weeks. So if you're not yet a Christian, we want to build a case why you should receive Jesus as your own Lord and leader of your life. But if you are a Christian, and I know most of you in this room are, and maybe a lot of you watching, or those of you that are listening as well, maybe you already are, we want to also build a case why you should make Him not just the add-on to your life, but the central character. You see, is Jesus just your phone a friend, or is He your friend for life? Is He the one you turn to out of desperation, or, or the one that you, that you turn to out of design? Is he the one that you have on your bench, if in a football analogy, and you bring him on second half when things are struggling? Or is he the playmaker that everything runs through? Is he your last resort or is he your first thought? Is he your one in many or is he your one and only? Because I think sometimes even as Christians, we treat Jesus like that. We treat him like, like, we, like we say at Christmas, you know, a dog is not just for Christmas, it's for life. And we, we like that a little bit with Jesus sometimes. Jesus is okay for Sundays and okay for Christmas and Easter, but the rest of the time, I want to build a case and we want to build a case because Jane and Andy and Simon are going to be teaching through these weeks as well. We want to build a case where we, you and I should make Jesus the number one in our lives. And we're going to look at this verse, okay, this one verse in, in Isaiah. And let me give you a little bit of background first. Isaiah, the book Isaiah was written around 700 years before the coming of Christ. Um, it was written it, uh, primarily to the kingdom of Judah that were going through times of revival, rebellion, revival, rebellion. They were threatened by local superpowers, Assyria and Egypt. And, uh, and the prophet Isaiah wrote a lot of the messianic prophecies, which are prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, a lot of them that we find are written in the book of Isaiah. And you're going to hear more about that over the next few weeks as it builds. Um, and the thrust of Isaiah is really all about the fact that God will send a Messiah who will restore or will bring the kingdom of God to earth as it is in heaven. And the justice and the righteousness of God will rule and reign on the earth. Don't we long for that? And of course, we know as Christians that Jesus came hundreds of years after the book of Isaiah and fulfilled all of that. But we still, so, so he's come, but we still want to see him come even more, don't we? So the kingdom is here, but it's still coming. It's this kind of paradoxical thing that's going on there, really. And that's what Isaiah said. And um, my, I want to build a case for you this morning when, by looking at one of these names of the Messiah, wonderful counselor. And I want to suggest why you should make him the wonderful counsel of your life. And why if you have made him, are you making him? Is he actually active as a wonderful counselor in your life? So I want to look first at the first word, he is wonderful. You see, some translations um, put a comma between wonderful and counselor. But the original language in Hebrew, there was no punctuation. But let's just talk about wonderful for a moment. He is wonderful, isn't he? And the word in Hebrew literally means incomprehensible. In other words, like he's mind-blowing. It's like you can't get your head around him. The historian H.G. Wells, who also writes, wrote science fiction books, he said this, more than 1900 years later, a historian like myself, who doesn't even call himself a Christian, finds the picture centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. Then he says this, the historian's test of an individual's greatness is what did he leave to grow? By this, Jesus stands first. So a guy who's not a Christian, who's a historian, says if you look at Jesus, he stands way above everyone else. It's incomprehensible. He is wonderful. But what I want us to look at is the next. He is a wonderful counsellor. He's a wonderful counsellor. I want to look at this phrase, wonderful counsellor. Counselor, what makes him such a wonderful counselor? Firstly, folks, he gets you, he understands you. You know, one of the things that's frustrating is when someone gives you advice and you think, Oh, yeah, that's all very well for you to say that, but you don't know my life. Anyone ever felt like that? And, and we have that a lot in our life, don't we? Where people give us advice and, and we just think, That's all right for you to say that, but you just don't understand this. 
You know, I, I love going to other cultures, as, as you know. And, and last week, being in Albania and being in this situation, and I've been in Albania many, many times, but still things are happening in the culture and in, the, in their society. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I don't get it. I just don't understand. And in my head, I want to say things like, which is terribly, awfully patronizing. I want to say things like, well, why don't you just do this? Anyone ever thought like that? Well, the reason that that doesn't work is that you don't understand their culture, and I don't. Because I don't get it, because I'm not in it. But here's the thing. Jesus is a wonderful counselor because he gets you. He understands you. He knows your life. There's a great old preacher story, which some of you will have heard of, but I love this story and I want to share it. Uh, and it's this old couple that go into McDonald's, okay, and they buy one meal and they take the one meal and they sit down and he cuts the Big Mac in two and he gives, he gives his wife the one half and he has the other half. And then he takes the fries and he pours them uh, on, the play, on, on the tray and he puts half for his wife and half for himself. Then he gets the drink, puts half the drink in one cup, half in another, blah, blah, blah. But then he starts to eat and she doesn't eat. And everyone else around is feeling a little bit awkward. And they say, oh, maybe they can't afford it. And, and, and someone says, could we buy you? And I say, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. We love sharing it. We share everything we have. And then, and, and then she says, okay, okay. And then one says, but, well, if you share everything you have, why is he eating and you're not eating? And she says, I'm waiting for the teeth. <laughs> I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. At the first service, people visibly went like that when I said that. It's just an old preacher story. We share. The thing is, it's very easy to look at someone else's life and to make a judgment. I'm still waiting. Some of you are still getting the joke. That's, that's frightening, that is. <laughs> Slow it down for you. We make a judgment on someone else because we don't understand what they're going through. And the reality is Jesus is a wonderful cancer because he gets you. Look at this verse in Hebrews chapter 4. This is a great verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he was without sin. What makes him a wonderful counselor, folks, is that he gets you. He understands you. He knows what it is to walk in our shoes. Sure, he doesn't know what it is to, to does he go Apple or Samsung. He hasn't had to, to, to deal with that really important issue. But every single human issue he's walked through, he knows pain, he knows loss, he knows confusion, he knows anger, he knows disappointment, he knows hunger, he knows tiredness, he knows thirst, he knows all of that. He gets you, which is what makes him a wonderful counsellor. But secondly, he's a wonderful counsellor because he knows it all. He is the ultimate know-it-all. We don't like know-it-alls, do we? But I tell you what, he's the ultimate know-it-all. He knows everything. Jesus is the wisest man who's ever lived. You've got the Dalai Lama and you've got Freud and you've got Gandhi and you've got Oprah and they're all wise and they've all got things to say. Nobody is as wise as him. Jesus does not reveal the wisdom of God. Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the revelation. He is the wisdom of God. And boy, do we need wisdom right now, don't we? And here's the thing. If we want wonderful counsel in our life, wonderful advice, okay, then, 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 then we need to know what wisdom is. And we need to know the difference between wisdom and knowledge. You can know a lot and not be wise. J just come with me here for some quotes just to uh, explain it better than I can. This is uh, Charles Spurgeon, a famous preacher. He said this, Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great a fool as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Another guy called Jim Packer, he wrote this, Wisdom is the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. I want to ask Russ and Dan and Jack to come and join me on stage for a minute. A little ripple of applause for our wonderful volunteers. Thank you. Come on. Guys, just come and stand there for a moment if you can, all right? I didn't do this at the first service, but I just feel led of the Lord to embarrass these three. Uh, no, 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 I don't mean that at all. So the Bible talks in the book of Proverbs a lot around basically three kinds of people, all right? There are basically three kinds of people on the planet. The Bible says there are evil people, there are wise people, and there are foolish people. All right. So <laughs> just be evil for a moment, all right? <laughs> That's it, okay. So we'll just turn Russ around just for a moment. I know it's not his better side. His better side is definitely his front. But, but so let's, let's ignore 
the evil, the evil people for a moment. We've got wise people and we've got foolish people. Now, in our minds, we think, <laughs> we think the wise people are people who know a lot and the foolish people are people who don't know a lot. But that's not biblical wisdom or biblical foolishness. It's different to that. So I want to explain it if I can. So basically, wise people are people, if you can go with me, Dan, who are open. And what they do is that when light comes that brings truth, they adjust themselves to the light because they're open. But what foolish people do is they're not open, they are closed. And what they do is that when light comes, they don't adjust themselves to the light, they try to adjust the light to themselves. Are you with me? This is such a brilliant, it's not me, this is a guy called Henry Cloud that did this. Brilliant illustration, so simple of wisdom and foolishness. Wise people are open. So when truth comes, they adjust themselves to the truth. Foolish people are closed. Some of the foolish people are the most intelligent people with the most amount of knowledge, but they're closed because when the truth comes, they don't adjust themselves to the truth. They try to adjust the truth to themselves. Does that make sense? Round of applause to our three people, especially, especially the evil character that was so important. And what, what I want to say to you today is, are you wise or are you foolish? Because if you are wise, you want truth to come into your life. You want to know the truth because the Bible says the truth sets you free, whatever it is. And I know a lot of people and they will go around lots of people asking them to speak into their life until they hear what they want to hear. That's called foolishness. But wisdom is when you receive the light and you receive truth. You don't try and adjust or deny or defend or twist or manipulate the light. You adjust yourself to the light. That's wisdom. And the Bible said that Jesus is a wonderful counselor who can bring the wisdom of God into our lives. He can bring the truth into our lives. Great verse in Ephesians chapter 5. Paul says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. What Paul is literally saying, be very careful then how you live. That word live literally means walk. And the phrase careful, the verb of that, is watch around because you might step into something you don't want to step into. So what Paul is saying, be really careful, be really alert, watch how you live your life. Don't be unwise, closed, adjusting the light, but be wise, open, adjusting yourself to the light so you will make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And I, I opened this up a few years ago. Um, it was a whole talk, so I'm going to do it in one minute. But, but, but the biggest question out of that verse that you could ask, which will save you time, tears, and even money, is this. What is the wise thing to do? If you and I asked that question on a regular basis, it would change our life. What's the wise thing to do? Now, here's the thing. You've got to go deep in that. What's the wise thing to do in the light of my past experiences? So you've just broken up a relationship with someone. Is it the wise thing to do for you who've just broken up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend to go right back into another relationship? Maybe not. But actually, you've been broken up for quite a while. So is it the wise? It could be. But in the light of your past experiences, not mine, what's the wise thing for you to do? Some of you in this room, some of you watching and listening, you know in the light of your past experiences, it's not wise for you to go near certain things. It's not wise for you to go to certain places. I could go to them and that would be fine. If you went, catastrophic. Why? Because it's not the wise thing for you to do, given or in the light of your past experiences. But what about what's the wise thing to do in the light of your current circumstances? So uh, when, when you're um, uh, single, you live a certain lifestyle. When you're married, your circumstances change. When me and Alison got married, uh, we uh, went on honeymoon for three days to Scotland. It's all we could afford. But we'd already booked to go to a Christian conference called Spring Harvest, which we went to the previous years. Now, the previous years, when we went together to that conference, I went and stayed with my mates in one chalet, and Alison went and stayed with her mates in another. When we were married in our early 20s, and we arrived, arrived at Spring Harvest, we got out of the car from our honeymoon, we got the bags, I went off with my mates that way, she said, oi, because I was living differently in my head. In the light of your current circumstances, don't live as a single guy when you're married. 
So this is such a great question. What's the wise thing to do in the light of your past experiences? What's the wise thing to do in the light of your current circumstances? And thirdly, what's the wise thing to do in the light of your future hopes and dreams? Can I just say something really strong? If you want to be a certain person in the future, wisdom is going to dictate the choices you make today. I've sat with too many people over too many years saying, if you keep doing this, where do you think you're going to end up? And I say to people who, who wreck in their marriages and wreck in their lives and wreck in their finances, is that the person that you want to be in the future? You want to be that person who for the sake of that temporary fleeting bit of pleasure is actually going to have your kids and your grandkids look at you in the future and say, who are you? Is that who you want to be? Wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is the application of knowledge in the right way. And wisdom comes from the wonderful counsellor. So if there is this person called Jesus, who is this wonderful counsellor, who can bring wisdom into our lives, how does he do it? Well, he does it through prayer. He does it through his word, the word of truth. He does it through his spirit. But he also does it through his people. And I want to show you another quote, which is really, really powerful. And it's this by a guy called Irving McManus. Your greatest strength is not when you can prove that you don't need anyone. Your greatest strength is you when, when you no longer have to prove that you can do it alone. I wish I'd written that. Your greatest strength is not when you can, can prove that you don't need anyone. Your greatest strength is when you no longer have to prove that you can do it alone. The Bible said, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Here's what happens. I call this the dimmer switch principle, okay? When God shines light and I step into it, his hand is on the dimmer switch, he turns the light up. We get even more light and we can step into it. When God shines light and I don't step into it, he turns it down. We wonder as Christians sometimes why we're living in darkness. Maybe it's because we're not stepping into his light. And as we step into his light on the path, there's a lamp for my feet, a light to my path. As we step into the light, he turns up the light and we see more and more of the path in front of us. He is a wonderful counsellor because A, he gets you. B, he's a know-it-all. And C, he is a wonderful counsellor because he gives more than advice. He gives himself. I love that, don't you? The word um, uh, counsellor in the original language is the word paraclete. It means counsellor, it means advocate, it means intercessor, it means legal assistant, it means helper, it means encourager. But ultimately, guys, what it means is the one who comes alongside. Because what Jesus does is he doesn't stay up there, all right, in like an ivory tower telling you what you ought to do. But the Bible says he comes alongside you. It's the word for the Holy Spirit. He comes alongside you. He comes to say, hey, here's the wisdom, but I don't want to just tell it you. I want to actually come and bring it to you as well. And the Bible says that when he comes alongside you, he comes to bring comfort. And sometimes we look at that word comfort as a very soppy word, but the word comfort is broken down. Come means with and fort or forte means strength. When the wonderful counselor comes alongside you, he comes to bring strength. Strength to do the decisions that are the wise decisions. Strength to live the life that God has called us to live. And there's two aspects of, of, of this kind of word as well. One is the kind of legal aspect. But there's another in which the sense of this word is like the second in a ring. You know, like in a boxing ring. And the second would be the trainer. The one who comes with a towel around his head. The one who comes to, you know, as, as, the, as the boxer sits down uh, in, in the interval, in between the rounds. He's, he's, br he's bloody, he's bruised, he's beaten. You know, the, the, the trainer is the one that kind of says, hey, you can do it. He's the wonderful counsellor. He's the one that gives him advice, but also gives him strength and inspiration. I believe in you. Actually, I love you. I want the best for you. Anyone remember this film? Come on. What's that film? Rocky. Anyone seen Rocky? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, however many there were. Okay, I, I remember seeing them when I was a, a, t a teenager or, or a young man in the 80s when they first came out. And then, and then there was a... All right, there was, there was five of them, and then there was a gap, and then they made another Rocky, 
And now I'm in my 40s and I snuck out to watch it secretly. Do you know what I mean? It's such a bad film, like at tea time. And as, and as I went in the cinema, I realized that there were a whole load of other middle-aged men in the cinema, all watching the film, all who snuck out to watch it. And when the music started, our heads were going like that. Dun, 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 dun. Fantastic. But this is Mickey the trainer. And in one of the Rocky films, Mickey dies. Okay, and then a few later in the films, uh, Rocky is, is in uh, fighting the young guy and he's called Tommy Gunn. What a great name, Tommy Gunn. And he's fighting this guy and this guy Tommy knocks him down and knocks him out on the sidewalk, on the pavement. And then he knocks him down in the canvas. And in the film, I don't want to be too, stretch it here really. In the film, what happens is that the, uh, Rocky sees Mickey and now he's died but he almost sees this resurrection of his trainer and when he sees the trainer it breathes inspiration into his life because the trainer is the one that knows him he gets him he doesn't give him just advice but he comes and brings him himself and there's a great bit in the film where actually it's the vision of the one who died who kind of rose again who believes in him who comes to him and says listen you might be knocked down but you're not knocked out that's what we, That's the sense of the meaning of this phrase, that he's a wonderful counselor. He's the paraclete. He's the one that comes alongside. He's the one that believes in us. He is the one that brings inspiration into our lives. So do you need the wonderful, wonderful counselor to come alongside you today? Maybe you do. Maybe you're facing a really difficult decision and you need the wisdom of a wonderful counselor. Maybe you're facing a tough situation and you don't know how you're going to get through and you need the strength of the wonderful counsellor who comes alongside you. I want to ask the band if they would come back up. Why don't we just close our eyes for a moment and pray. In a moment we're going to take communion together which is a fantastic privilege and responsibility that we get as Christians to take bread and to take juice which are representative in many senses, but there's something even more than that. You know, the Bible said that we should do this in remembrance of Him. And it is Remembrance Day when we remember sacrifice. We remember people laying down their lives for others. But we today want to remember not just that, and we do that, but we want to remember the ultimate sacrifice, the one who laid down his life for us. The one who came as a baby, who grew to a man, who then died and rose again the wonderful counsellor. And as we do that, I want to pray for some of you this morning. And uh, maybe, maybe this morning you are struggling in your life. Maybe you need some wisdom. Maybe you need the wonderful counsellor to come alongside you. Then as I pray, just open up your heart and say, Lord, I want to be wise. When you shine the light, I want to adjust myself to the light. I don't want to be foolish and closed and try and manipulate or adjust the light to me but I want to be open to you so let me pray for you Father in these moments as we take communion together and we remember Jesus Lord we want to thank you for the wonderful counsellor all we want not just for Christmas but all we want in our lives is a wonderful counsellor and we have one his name is Jesus and so Lord I pray that for anybody here in this room or listening or watching today, and we need wisdom right now, Lord, would you come alongside us and bring wisdom in Jesus' name? Would you come alongside and bring comfort and bring strength and bring encouragement? Lord, some of us are knocked down. We're on the canvas. We're on the pavement. We're knocked down, but Lord, we are not knocked out. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that as we eat and drink, we would see the one who died and who rose again, the wonderful counsellor coming to us, bringing strength into our lives. And so, Lord, we receive him again today as we receive the bread in Jesus' name. Amen. The guys could come straight away, please, and hand out the bread and the juice. And can I just encourage you to hold on to it for a moment? Okay, and as you hold on to the bread, hold on to the cup, and then we're going to eat and drink together. You know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let me just, just, just listen to this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was not a belief that grew up in the early church. It is the belief around which the early church grew up. The resurrection of Jesus is everything. You know that, don't you? And, and while you're receiving the bread and the, and the juice this morning, I want to read something to you. 
And this is about Jesus, the wonderful counsellor. And then as we eat and drink in a moment, this is what you're kind of receiving again today. He began his ministry by being hungry, yet he is the bread of life. He ended his earthly ministry by being thirsty, yet he is the living water. He was weary, yet he is our rest. He paid tribute, yet he is the king. He was accused of having a demon, and yet he cast out demons. He wept, yet he wipes away all of our tears. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver, yet he redeemed the world. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, yet he is the good shepherd. He died, yet by his death, he destroyed the power of death. And his name is Jesus. Amen. How many of you are grateful to know him today? And I want to say, if you don't know Jesus this morning, you can. You can know him. You can know the wonderful counselor. You know, I don't know what you want for Christmas, but let me tell you, there isn't a better gift you can have for Christmas than Jesus. He's what it's all about. So in a moment when, when the bread and the juice have been served, we're going to eat and we're going to drink together. And then we're going to celebrate. We're going to worship. We're going to thank God for this incredible gift of Jesus, the wonderful counsellor. We're going to declare in the final song, this is our God. And my prayer and our prayer through this series is that if you know Jesus, that you will be so inspired again. And if you don't, we want to build a case why you should invite Him to be the Lord and the leader of your life in this season. And wouldn't it be amazing if come Christmas, on Christmas Day, when you open your presents and eat your turkey and do all the rest of the stuff that you're going to do, wouldn't it be amazing if in the middle of that, you know that with all of that, which is great fun and we all love it, in the middle of that, who it's all about is the wonderful counsellor, Jesus. Wouldn't that be incredible? So, Emma, if I could take some bread. So if you could take the bread and the juice, and I want to invite you to stand with me. If you're able to do that, let's stand. And if you're just being received, then you'll catch us up. <laughs> Why don't we eat and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. Lord, we thank you for your body. And we thank you for what you've done. You are the wonderful counselor. Now we eat in Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now we take the cup and we drink to celebrate the life that Jesus given for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, just in your own heart, why don't you just thank God this morning? You know, when church was smaller, in old school kind of times, this would be the time when some of us would be thanking God and praying out loud. And it's difficult in a, in a bigger church. We understand that. But right where you are, why don't you just thank Him this morning? Thank Him for His wonderful counsel for His presence in your life. Thank you, God, that you're an incredible God. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, at the first service, someone came to me afterwards and felt that God had given them a word which they didn't share, but maybe for some of you here at the second service. And the word was this, that there are some of you and you want to receive advice and help and strength from the wonderful counsellor, but you feel so diminished right now in your life. And that was the word. You feel so diminished that you don't have strength almost to receive it. And what she felt God was saying is this, all you need to do is to look to Him. If you can just look to Him, He's already on His way to you. So maybe if that's you this morning, you feel diminished. You don't feel that you have the strength. You know, if you, if you wanted to go and see a counsellor, you've got to pluck up the courage, you've got to phone, you've got to book in, you've got to do all that stuff. And maybe some of you, you feel too diminished to approach Him right now. But the word was, just look to Him. Just look to Him. He's already on His way to you. So Father, I pray, if that word is for anybody here, may they receive it and may they look to you as we worship you now in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you, lift up your voices and let's worship our great God together. <laughs> 